there's a whole variety of slang terms used to describe certain aspects and or activities within freight culture, right? Absolutely. Uh, freight trains have its own slang. Um, you know, it. I don't want to say it changes through the years, but, you know, it's always updated in a sense. But so much of the slang of freight trains um, continues to go back to people that were riding the trains, people that were working on the trains. Mm-hmm. You know, the freight trains also have a huge history of monikers that are often looked at as, oh, hobos were doing this. It's not necessarily hobos that were doing them with the oil bars and the chalk sticks and still to today. Of course, some hobos and rail riders are doing it, but so much of it was rail workers that were in the yards, bored as hell, had these grease pens, these chalk, this chalk and everything else um, with them. And um, it was fantastic what they were doing. They're bored. And, you know, instead of writing, you know, fix this train or paint here or whatever to this wheel, you know, they start drawing a little character. That's incredible. Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official dot com. Street Culture TV. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Get yourselves ready for the upcoming Hoddle Wars. It's time to graph punks up and get up with some NFT gaming. Also, big shout out to Chief Rocker Gear from streets to stage. Chief Rocker is the streetwear of champions. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller live and direct central London or as central as you need to be, could be, want to be, desire to be. All the heads that know, sharing is caring, spread the love, tell a friend to tell a friend, subscribe, hit the bell, do the thing, hit the button, all of that. Not to mention the television app for the sport and art, street culture and more. Available now, free download, iPhone, Android, for all those sports you love and you're interacting and are a part of. Uh, we are going transatlantic right now. We're going up the other side to our dear friends in the US to talk to a gentleman that is spearheading in a rather big way, championing championing for years uh, the uh, street art and graffiti culture, um, particularly um, in light of Beyond the Streets, uh, the exhibition place in LA, um, and, you know, currently touring the world. Uh, 2006, Freight Train Graffiti was the name of the book. Uh, Roger Gaspin, Dan Radley, Ian Sattler uh, pulling together uh, a seminal piece, uh, opening the doors on what uh, Freight Train Graffiti is, particularly for the US. Well, they've revamped it for 2023. Serves you all right. And inside the place, we have Roger Gaspin. How are we, my brother? We're all right this morning. Hello. Thanks for uh, grabbing me. <laughs> Grabbing is the right word. I mean, we were literally, I mean, it's very early in the morning for you over there, isn't it, Roger? It's all right. It's what, 7.32 a.m. right now? We're good. We've been up for like two hours already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you get the most work done when uh, when no one else is awake? Absolutely. I get the most work done in the morning or late at night usually when uh, there's somebody I'm working with on t- sometimes on awake, but it's just, it's smoother. Yeah, too right it is. I prefer it that way personally. Um so you're not feeling too tired, you're ready to rock and roll. We're going to deep dive into this. There's so many conversations I want to have about this book. We're talking about Freight Train Graffiti, right? We're talking about nothing, but because for the UK, um, obviously we aren't in the same uh, ballpark so far as freights go. Um, but uh, one thing that that I love about the projects that you bring to the forefront is that the, the, the unspoken side of the culture, the, the areas in which often get overlooked. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. That's uh, what I'm uh, living here doing. I'd been involved in freight train graffiti since the early 90s when I got into graffiti. Uh, I grew up in uh, the Washington, D.C. suburbs, loving graffiti, running around painting graffiti. Pretty early on, I was traveling to paint graffiti. A lot of my friends were, you know, at that time, you're 14, 15 years old, and you have a friend that's in their early 20s. Holy shit, they're old, you know, and it's... uh, (laughs) Shocking. And uh, they're more worldly than you. They've done this. They've done that. And um, they have more friends they're trading pictures with in different cities and, and what have you. And all of a sudden, um, they're talking to you about freight trains and you're in a freight train yard or you're painting underneath a bridge and a freight train goes by and there's graffiti on it. And you're like, oh, shit, what's that? That looks like it's from New York or it says New York on the side of it. And you're in D.C. and you're 15 years old and it's 1994. And you're like, I just saw graffiti go by from New York. That's fucking cool. And it's a whole other, you know, it's a whole other thing. 
And I very quickly started realizing that people were painting these freight trains and people were painting these freight trains for multiple reasons, but they were painting these freight trains mainly because they travel, they move your name outside of your city and you could live in some tiny little bumfuck town somewhere and become famous globally painting, not famous globally, famous in your country or wherever these trains go. Mm-hmm. Freight trains, I guess famous globally if enough people are taking pictures and sending them around. But, um, you know, the, the, the real goal is... Uh, saturation of the system and at that time in the 90s if you painted 50 or so trains a year you were up because you'd go into these yards and there'd be nothing on them so you know my fascination was just these trains and the stories of them and who was painting them and at the time i i mean maybe this sounds a little bit forward to say but you were usually one, two, three degrees of separation away from anyone painting the trains. And you could pretty much figure out whom it was. And the history of the trains, you can always argue what it is. Oh, this person was doing this on a train in, you know, 1974 in New York City uh, because it was next to the subway layup or this or this. But those are all anomalies. But the real start of painting freight trains as the saturation of them is today starts in the late 80s. There's moments in the mid 80s there's moments here and there but the really hardcore painting of them starts in the late 80s and those people especially in the mid 90s were approachable their shit was still running on the trains you could talk to them and uh mm-hmm. we start fast forward you know we're making books we're doing things and um myself and several friends have just starting to amass these massive collections of freight train images and we're traveling to paint freight trains to other cities. We're meeting other people doing it. We're going into the yards. We're Mm. taking photos all the time. And it was just so, we just loved it so much. And, uh, you know, I'm making books, I'm telling stories. And one story that had not been told outside of some of these smaller magazines here and there was the story of freight train graffiti. And we were telling stories. We were making books. We had the opportunity. Uh, Darren Rowland, who was one of my you know old friends at the time and even older friend now, um, was a very active freight train graffiti writer, had a great collection, had a really great list of contacts that was a little different than my list of contacts. Mm-hmm. So overlap too much, which made it even better. And we started talking and we were like, well, let's go pitch a book about freight train graffiti. Um, I'd been putting out a few books. I was publishing a magazine. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, Did we know what we were doing, making a book? Sort of. You know, I'd made some books before, so it was, you know, realistic. And we just jumped in and um, made a proposal. And the goal was just to tell the story of the history of freight train graffiti up to probably 2004 ish, which is the time, you know, we kind of wrapped the book right. and talked to as many of the inventors and many of the originators and many of the active people who were doing it as we could. And that's what we did. You know, with a, it, graffiti can be fraught sometimes. And as a, as a culture capture of the documenter of the scene yourself, you know, often there's conflict of interest, uh, in, um, well, interest for sure, but there's conflicts in timelines, uh, where things began, how and who did it. I guess from a freight train point of view, you, you know, you were quite spoiled in the in a way that you were there at that time and you were able to okay, reverse engineer maybe by a couple of months, maybe a year, but you had it all mapped. This was this was a real privy place to be, right? Yeah, I mean, you could say we had it mapped in a sense. We knew what was what. Um, you know, I I can't say we lived it in every city. And there was, of course, things we never fully got to experience. But absolutely, we lived it. And we were there of the era or era adjacent of the beginning of it enough mm-hmm. where the people that were there, it wasn't something they were reminiscing on from 35 years ago. It was still very, very much real. Of course, mm-hmm. there's, like I said, the oddities that we dug up that had happened, you know, 15, 20 years before that we needed to really dive in and find out about. But for the main push of the scene, it was still there and we were able to talk about it. And thinking back now, almost 20 years, um, give or take, since we were working on that and researching that, that's a long time. That's a lot of stuff. There's generations of artists since. I can only imagine what it was like being in those freight train yards for its time. Give us a descriptive you know, so what was it like? What was it like in the yards at that time? 
I don't think we realized at the time, at least myself didn't fully realize. And probably a lot of the friends I was with didn't realize because they were drunk a lot. Um, <laughs> the danger of the trains, mm-hmm. um, you know, we knew they were dangerous. We knew they could kill you. you. You know, you hear rumors of people getting hurt, but they were dangerous. Um, and at the time, there's not that many people painting them either. So if you're seen in a yard, it really is. Are you robbing the trains? Are you riding the trains? What are you doing? Because theft was always a major issue on the trains and still is today. Mm. And the police uh, that were watching the yards at the time, the workers that are watching the yards at the time, you know, this is the 90s or probably, you know, late 20s to 60 years old. They didn't grow up with a generation of graffiti. They didn't grow up with a generation of hip hop. They didn't grow up with a generation of punk rock. They didn't grow up with a generation of, you know, everyone at the checkout at Whole Foods having tattoos, you know, Mm -hmm. what happened. You know, they were really out to get people that were doing things in their place of work or their backyard. You know, they they weren't happy about it. Um, so we, you know, had to counteract that. <laughs> Not counteract that, but we just needed to be aware of that. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, painting freight trains, I, I can't say has gotten easier through the years because that's not the case, but there's been more artists who have become more aware and figured out more things, more locations have been discovered. Uh, in the beginning, sure, we get that those tracking numbers on them are probably ways to track them, but do we care that we're painting over them? Not really. You know, mm-hmm. do people still paint over the tracking numbers today? Of course they do, but a lot of people that are painting over them today uh, are painting the trains today or not painting over the tracking numbers. They're bringing masking tape and covering the tracking numbers, painting their piece and then pulling the masking tape off to reveal the numbers to let their graffiti live much, much longer. So, you know, in those early days, I mean, for me, they were the early days. There's a lot of people that were painting trains a lot earlier than I. And while I did paint a lot of freight trains, a lot of the people that we have in this book and that we've, you know, talked about painted trains way longer than I ever did um, and were much more skilled. But I mean, I spent a lot of time in freight yards and there was always an adventure. You know, there was always uh, some sketchy people uh that shouldn't have been there any more than you should have been there right uh, <laughs> a bit. Know, multiple times you know f- you know any graffiti raid will say this you know from hearing gunshots to you know finding some you know transient grave to something else like there was just always something different and sketchy and at the same time there's the places you could say and it's uh i've said this in a to a lot of friends, a lot of interviews and everything through the years, uh, the the whole bullshit of, oh, you could just go there and have a barbecue and like do whatever and paint all day. Like we're just going here. Like that's real. Um, you know, th- those places still exist. There's not as many as there used to be, but like, it's real. You know, you could really like hang out all day in a yard sometimes with a bunch of paint and just have fun um, and, and, do, and do your thing. Like it's always been different. That just blows my mind. I mean, yeah, those kind of conversations. Yeah, we used to smoke blunts. We used to, you know, just fucking chill out and not pay it any mind. You know, it it it's very romantic, isn't it? And and very much real. Um, the amount of people that say it. Um, in the in the contrast of how the book is presented now in its new deluxe form. In 2023, there's obviously different. Uh, aspects of security that come into play as well did you notice anything you know severely different in in the remake of this book you know any any new areas of attention where you you know that just wasn't even considered back in the day for when you first released it well we talked a lot about what to do you know so the book came out it had a great life i'm so pleased with it all of us were and it eventually as a lot of books do went out of print the mm-hmm. freight train movement kept going and going, and now it's hard to find a freight train out there in the world or in the U.S. that is not covered in graffiti, um, unless it's a new train or a train that just got buffed. Um, and, you know, while we used to be able to say we knew somebody or a couple, you know, degrees of separation away from someone, at this point, it's just like no idea. You know, it's just who knows? The trains are just so crushed. It's amazing. Um wow. And it it is what it is. And, you know, when we're talking about redoing this book now that we have it back, what do we do? Do we go try and tell the story and like update where we're at? Um, And we're like, there's literally just 
tens of thousands of people out there painting these trains now. I don't think we can even begin to try and tell this story again. Um, and again, so much of this story the last 15 plus years lives online too. And now it lives on Instagram, of course. So why do we need to tell this? Not need. I mean, this story is an important story, but there, there's a lot of incredible documenters out there shooting the trains daily, telling the story. And in my um, obsessive personality, I've continued to do everything I can do to dig up graffiti history yeah. uh, nonstop. And that's not history of just um, freight train graffiti. You know, that's global ephemera that's just so many things and mm -hmm. i continue to find just incredible photos of freight train graffiti uh of the era uh we were working on things i would have absolutely loved to have when we were working on um the freight train graffiti book like holy shit look at this photo look at this yeah. photo things just kept popping up and it was incredible um uh, and then i was working on a documentary about freight train graffiti called rolling like thunder a couple years back which yeah you banging which you can watch online pretty easily. Yeah. Um, we're around and uh, I'm digging through new friends, old friends, a lot of people's collections um, because we're interviewing them in their homes. They're digging out boxes of photos. They probably haven't looked at in, you know, 15, 20 years or longer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have scanners with us. We have some, you know, PAs with us and it's important. So we start scanning a bunch of people's images because, we're going to probably use them in the film at mm -hmm. the same time I'm thinking, damn, I really got to remake this book. I've been talking shit about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been talking to Darren about it and talking to Ian about it. Like the, you know, our, my, my co-authors in the book, mm -hmm. like it just finally needs to happen. And um, working on that movie really kicked me in the ass because I was just continuing to see such great archives of things that were out there of course the first book i couldn't put or the three of us couldn't put everyone in it it was just mm -hmm. too many people or we missed someone because we fucked up i mean there's you know a, a lot of reasons not everyone was in it and it's not necessarily personal reasons we just you know that can happen it can happen all the time it just happens um and we did it and uh we said, or do we want to remake this book or do we just want to put this book out? And I was like, the original book was supposed to be big and hardbound and, you know, different. And the first book was big, but it wasn't hardbound. So I, uh, I, I, I sat down um, with everybody and uh, just kind of started digging out all the files. The book had been designed in Quark. So we needed to, for those of you that remember what Quark is, it's pre um, InDesign. Uh, <laughs> Different program and we basically literally needed to rebuild the entire book which was a whole other crazy thing um, wow so, uh you know we couldn't find every image there are images on you know weird old discs dvds images i had to go dig in storage to find to rescan um but we found most all of the images from the book um and then again i had all these archives and the book is told, we probably interviewed, I don't remember, 100 plus people for it. <laughs> uh, I did not want to revisit more interviews and all of that. It was just going to be too much. Yeah. So it was really straightforward. We redesigned the book, staying with the original design of it, and simply added to it. Um, but we added photography. We added photos that weren't in the original version. We added artists that weren't in the original version. But we stayed true to the era of the original version of the book. So anything we added was basically photography 2004-ish or right. early. And that gave a, a much clearer, easier indication of what to do and how to do it. Um, and it, it, it worked. It was great. Um, we added over 500 photos to this damn book. 500 and, uh, photos. Did you did you exactly. did you catch any resistance or anything from the like any resistance from the, the more freight purists that you know perhaps didn't want their their archive in the book? Every you know early on when we were working on the book, um, you know, in in two thousand in the early two thousands, there were definitely artists we were working with that were like, I don't want you know you to put me in there. Are you a cop? Like even though you know we had friends of friends that knew them, it was just a lot of the same kind of bullshit story over and over again of just paranoid people. But you yeah, know, let's be real. let's be real. It's people have every right to be paranoid. They're out, you know, no matter how beautiful we might say this culture is, it's illegal, and you're breaking in places and doing it. Yeah, so, for sure. 
And often, you know, that's maybe not the only crime you're doing either. So uh, it's it's safe to say people were a little paranoid, but in the end, it all worked out just fine. And what we did with the new version, uh, when getting photos, we had so many people with just open arms of, you know, that book really helped the culture. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we really wanted to make sure that we want to make sure with all of our projects that they're not just made for the public, you know, they're made for the graffiti insider too. And the graffiti insider can walk away from them, really enjoying them and loving them and seeing new things in them. Not dude, just dude, how the- do you how do you create a fine you, there is a fine line. I think you you're one of the people that kind of created that fine line of walking, like you say, authenticity on one side doing it for the graffiti writers to its prosperity as a as a, 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 a an archive but then you have the more commercial side of, of an audience or a, a viewer or a reader that um is completely naive to the to the sport and just takes it at face value and is entertained how, how do you balance that off It's a tough balance, but it's just remembering who you're talking to. You know, you're talking to a large group of people and you need to not just sit there and name check graffiti facts that to me even get nerdy at some point. Like I was in this crew in 1992, then it merged into this crew, then it changed to this, then it changed to this, then it changed to this. Like, yes, in the scheme of things and the graffiti evolution, so many of those things are important and I don't want to pretend they're not but it just sometimes it becomes too much. And if you can't drag people in, um, I mean, I'm sorry, you can't drag everyone in all the time. You know, you have to get them interested. Oh shit. What's over there. What's going on. What's this. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, you need the, the candy, you need the great photos. You need the taglines. You need the artists that are the, the artist's favorite artists and all of those things to really make it work. Um, and that's what we've thankfully been able to continue to do. Um, you know, I don't want to say let's make a big flashy Instagram moment for everything because that's like the agency buzzword and what everyone asks for these days mm-hmm. and has for the last 10 years. But it's really <laughs> it's not going anywhere anytime soon either. <laughs> exactly. And that's fine. But it's understanding how to do that and just respect the graffiti artist, you know, respect the artist. You know, and so many times it's asking them, what do you want to see? What do you want to tell? Not always just telling them what we want from them. Mm, I got you. In 2023, how is freight trains perceived in comparison to uh, underground trains, you know, metro trains? I mean, the, 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 the subways will always, to so many people, you know, remain true, remain pure and mm. remain. Know, the main 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 thing no matter what and that's all they ever want and they're still going to be the batch of artists that travel the world mm-hmm. painting commuter subway anything they can do that rolls and there's been quite a resurgence in new york city of that and it's been incredible to see they just uh are crushing those trains more than yeah I- for real yeah oh, boy and, and they're running somewhat and of course a lot of the people that are out there doing that you know go paint freight trains too. A lot of the people that are out there painting those think painting freight trains is, you know, stupid, go paint your other things. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, they're totally different animals, but they have a lot of common, um, uh, artists that adorn them. You could say, yeah, for Uh, sure. (laughs) But you know, the, the freight, the freight train world is, you know, constantly going and the freight train world is in everyone's face more and more and there's no way it can't be yeah for sure it's just inherent because of the distance they travel um and on that note like you, i guess it's like the it's like rollerblade versus roller skates you know the, the two different the, the same mediums but different uh actions and there is a slang that there's a whole variety of slang terms used to describe certain aspects and or activities within freight culture right absolutely uh freight trains have its own slang um you know it i don't want to say it changes through the years but you know it's always updated in a sense but so much of the slang of freight trains um continues to go back to 
people that were riding the trains, people that were working on the trains. Mm -hmm. You know, the freight trains also have a huge history of monikers that are often looked at as, oh, hobos were doing this. It's not necessarily hobos that were doing them with the oil bars and the chalk sticks and still to today. Of course, some hobos and rail riders are doing it, but so much of it was rail workers that were in the yards, bored as hell, had these grease pens, these chalk, this chalk and everything else um, with them. And um, it was fantastic what they were doing. They're bored. And, you know, instead of writing, you know, fix this train or paint here or whatever to this wheel, you know, they start drawing a little character. That's incredible. Isn't that, that, that is the ingenuity, the natural progress of what become freight culture. That's insane that it started with the workers who just had nothing bad creatively to do. Yeah, and that's you know it's kind of it's its own thing, yeah, um, and that's its own book in itself. That's its own culture in itself. Uh, Bill Daniel has been one of the great documenters of it, along with a few other people. He has a film, Who Is Bozo Texino, a book mm-hmm. most true. We touch on it in our freight train graffiti book, but we touch on it, you know, with with a chapter. We don't talk, you know, because it's its own thing, and we really want to, you know, let it, you know, let it live as its own own thing too. Mm. Uh, I want to big up. Uh, by the way, I want to big up my brother Risk, MSK, who I saw was at the launch. You had a a star studded lineup uh, at the uh, gallery of just the who's who of freights and them signing these books on launch day it was a real sight how on earth did that how how was that how was that even choreographed because uh obviously there was going to be people there that you know missed the boat on that and you know it, you probably oversubscribed with how many people were keen you know how, how did how did that how did that um come apparent and uh, what was the result of it on the day wrangling artists is not an easy thing. Uh, never has been. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyone who has to do that knows. Um, and we, uh, the Freight Train Graffiti book was coming out. We had a really great show up um, that was launching also that included Tim Conlon, who is an incredible, I keep saying that word incredible, but it's true. Uh, you know, an important Freight Train Graffiti writer and an important mm-hmm. just modern artist um, at this point and lives here in los angeles and is in the freight train graffiti book was a producer with me and helped create the freight train graffiti film and we looked at it as you know what the book's coming out around this time this is a whole reason to just say fuck it and let's make sure this book comes out at this time Mm -hmm. and so many of your friends my friends you know this is me and tim talking you know that want to see the show um would find this book interesting the collector's uh, that are out there that we're, you know, placing artwork with, you know, find it interesting, you know, when there's books that go along with things. So we um, made it happen and we opened the show on a Friday and Saturday we did a freight train graffiti book signing. Um, I, you know, it's as simple as opening up an Excel spreadsheet, writing down all the artists that you think would either fly out and jump, you know, jump on a plane, drive or live within, you know, a few hours mm. and, sending them a note and a lot of people I didn't talk to in 20 years. Some of them I'd never talked to because we dealt with them through a friend or just had their photo in the book. Uh, of course, DMS makes that a lot easier. Not everyone's on it, but it makes it a lot easier too. If people mm-hmm. you haven't talked to or don't have their info and we just invited a crap load of people. Um, of course you have to chase them a dozen times, not all of them, but a lot of them. And yeah. we had an overwhelming response and it was awesome. Uh, you know, power who created can control magazine, um came down you know he shot the cover photo and he's on the cover um wow that's amazing a lot of people came to town for it uh we had a list of 30 artists that were supposed to be their sign and i'm like not all these people are showing up like whatever so i didn't have i had enough chairs but i had nowhere near enough tables because i'm like these people are just not all coming 29 of them came stop it off really 29 and then there were a few people that showed up that were kind of pro- pro- peripheral that were great that were there too. I mean, it was just such a turnout. It was nuts. And I had no idea. I never have any idea what to expect with some of these things. I stopped um, having expectations for some signings and things like that, other than we're going to get together as a group because even if no one came, just the 30 of us together, so many of the people there had never met each other. A lot of them hadn't seen each other in 20 years. So everyone's going to have a good time as, as a reunion in a sense from that anyway. 
dude, that was like that sounds like a conference. It's a summit. It's like you had the who's who pretty much thirty. That's I mean that's a sizable amount, and man. I'd say I I don't remember, but probably almost three hundred people showed up that day. That's you know, incredible. Meet the artists and have things signed. Do you did, 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 does it ever sink in the the scope of graffiti in 2023 and how far? Not only how far has it come. That's a real lame question. And what I mean is the 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 expansiveness in how it's tolerated, uh, appropriated, and how, yeah, and how it, it, it the reins are off. The opportunities are endless. Does does that ever does that ever come to your thoughts ever? I mean, everything is just going. It's bigger. It's better. It's louder. It's crazier. I mean, everything. There's just no stopping. Literally, I know that sounds like so cliche in a sense, but it's literally like no stopping. It just keeps fucking going, and there's more and more generations. And I've said this for years no matter what the rules are and what city and how crazy it gets, there's always that rambunctious teenager that wants to just go right on shit. And yeah. it's going to keep happening. It's just going to happen. Do, do you do, have you ever had like any resistance from authority? I mean, I can't imagine it. It's almost like, it's almost like the, the funnel of the eighties graffiti has been installed into all of these generations for 60 plus years to the point that now it's it's almost like no 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 you can't you just can't lock that off because this is part of our pop cultural dna now isn't it authorities can't do anything about this surely exactly i mean people are getting caught people are still going to jail people are still getting fined like it's absolutely happening but people are getting crazier with what they're doing. It's bigger. It's bolder. It's more in your face. Um, there's more styles. There's more, I'd say, graffiti tourism of people traveling um, to mm. do graffiti. And it keeps going and going and going. And, um, I mean, you could literally say twice a year there's a new generation of artists that you just keep seeing come up. And uh, as any subculture, culture, hobby, sport, you know, they all start to disappear and the real ones stay in it. And they're mm. it's getting so big. This is just part of our culture at this point. It's part of art. It's part of music. It's part of culture. It's not going anywhere. No. Do you see, do you see ebbs and flows, you know, like that 30 year cycle? Cause you know, you've been in it for a minute. Absolutely. As, as a, yeah, you see it. You must see the, the, the trend surface resurface, et cetera. Always. Every time you're like, I guess this is done. It's like, Six months later, you're like, oh, shit, look what just came out or what that person did. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's up. Oh. Don't doubt it. Did, did, you know, we we met at uh, Beyond the Streets London. It was a pleasure. And uh, in um, very brief conversations, I, I did mention what, While You Were Sleeping magazine because it was, it was very much a, a staple of my uh, my formative years, you understand, Roger? You know? I'm sorry. <laughs> It was there. Um, and one thing that I wanted to ask you there and then was, you know, did you ever, you know, when you were in those in the infancy of of just documenting, did 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 it ever occur to you that there'll be conversations like this in 20, 20 to 30 years plus onwards? I didn't think about it. I knew what we were doing, not necessarily everything we were doing at while you were sleeping. But so much of what I was doing of that time and of that era wasn't just, you know, putting out a ridiculous magazine. I was still archiving. I was collecting. I was documenting mm. so many different things. And I didn't stop to say, oh, I wonder what will happen in 30 years if this will be important or this or that. It was important to me at the time. I was in my early 20s. There's things I've been collecting at that point since I was 12, 13, 14 years old that I was still collecting and still interested in and at that point by the time while you were sleeping really is done you know i'd been into graffiti for close to you know 10 years at that point wow and it just seemed very inherent like why would i not care about this in time like of course this is important um so i wasn't thinking this is going to be my career 
this is what I'm going to do. It just always kept happening and kept spinning and rolling over. And there was always an artist friend that needed help, a random brand, a friend was a random brand, a friend was working at that needed assistance, doing experiential media based off of our knowledge of you know how streets worked or this or that or mm. current trends before the term experiential media happened. So it just unintentionally kept spinning. And I so thankfully and gratefully was able to continue to work with my friends that I'd met mostly through graffiti or a photographer I'd met through graffiti or a journalist I'd met that was doing something. And it just stayed in an ecosystem. And to this day, there's literally dozens and dozens of people I know and dozens and dozens of people I still work with that I met as a teenager. Some of them are still closest friends. Still closest friends now, even now. Yes. And a lot of those relationships came directly or indirectly through graffiti. That's incredible. Over the decades, you've been facilitating not just your projects, but other people's projects, bringing things to the finishing line. It's not easy to bind a book together, find the right publicist and launch it, let alone doing it independently. And you've been able to aid your friends, other people, as well as the the, the scenes that, that you're documenting on mass so would you can would you consider yourself as much a facilitator that your passion for facilitating as much as your passion for graph absolutely um continuing to make these projects happen help artists push things is just as important to me as getting the doing the projects myself i love when other people do projects I do not want to be, you know, the torchbearer of this culture um, and own it. You know, I want to have so many other people do things. And if I can have a 20 minute conversation, hour long conversation, suggest a printer to someone, whatever the hell it is to keep this culture moving, you know, I'm all for that. Like, I'd love if someone would come in, let's talk about the freight book. If someone wants to come in and make this go and be bigger and better and crazier and tell more history that I didn't know, please, there's more out there. Blow me away. I beg you to do it. Mm. I'll help. I'll, and I don't know how, but I'll try and help you to do it. You know, if someone wants to tell that one is mad that we didn't tell the up-to-date story of freight trains, like, please go do it. Like I'll, I'll help give you a formula. That's incredible. And I think that more viva la that, I think more of that in the culture. That's one thing that I do feel with a lot of people that do document street art and graph is they they're often uh it's it's almost like a thankless task just just uh some sort of um burning it's bigger than ambition it's it, it's it's the love for it isn't it it's a love for the art absolutely you know i there's a lot you know of easier ways to make a living you know i have a decent sized team um, that I couldn't be doing so much of this with. I mean, even the freight book, you know, all of that, like no one's doing this to go get rich in a Mm. sense, like doing it for love of the culture. And I think not, I think I know that comes through when you're looking at these books, when you're holding these books and walking through these projects, we're doing these exhibitions, we're doing these, you know, institutions we're helping to build and tell, you know, like, we are doing these things because we love the story. We love the culture and they need to happen. And we're finding ways to facilitate those to happen, you know, beg, borrow, steal, you know, in a billion other ways. And they're, they're continuing to happen. Thankfully. Yeah, man. I mean, I was there at the beastie boys, uh, gallery exhibition out in LA, um, to see beyond the streets and knowing that you, in between all of that, there's other projects going around. how do you keep it? how do you keep on top of, you know, a freight train, but fair enough. The freight train graph book is a it's a revised edition, but that still comes with its own team, its own think tank, its own headspace. Absolutely. That's that's a lot. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I don't probably. I don't do well if I'm not working on you know a dozen projects at a time. You know, I'm constantly doing fourteen things at once, and that's kind of how it goes. I have not exaggerating twelve books in production. We're working on a dozen plus shows from large scale to small scale, manage a handful of artists, 
product that continues to come out, you know, press, uh, managing, you know, several social media channels across our team mm. and it just goes. Thankfully, so much of it continues to feed into each other, though, and support each other. What, why, where does that come from? Where does that desire to what, not want to stop? Where does that come from from a Roger Gaspin point of view? Like, is, it, you, is this a... Is this a, a you know? Is this a fight against failure? Personal um, uh, goals? What 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 is that burn that you just can't be sitting down doing nothing? I think I just hate myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hurt me more. <laughs> yeah, I think I just want to keep punishing myself. Um, I, you know, I I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs. I never have done any of that in my entire life. Um, never had wow. a drug regret. Um, you know, I get fairly, well, I'm, I'm completely focused. I'm like, in a sense, very ADD at the same time and all over the place mm-hmm. in it, um, and can't pay attention to one thing, but I can pay attention to like 12 things at once. Very good. Uh, and a lot of people spend their time, money, hobby, life, and, you know, they want to drink coffee, play golf, drink wine you know, go on cruises, whatever it is, like, no problem. I respect that. You collect stamps. Like, this is what I do. Mm-hmm. Is this all Roger does? Is, you know, without getting too personal, of course. Is it, what, what is your, if if your vices aren't there, there aren't any vices like that, and you're working, you're constantly doing stuff. What's what's your, what's the little known fact about Roger that, that you know what I mean, that is your downtime? What is that? This is what I do. This is, I love you. I love that's the answer. <laughs> this is what I do. Do you ever get any kickback from, uh, you know, older friends that may have left the the graph scene, the freight train scene, and they're like, you're still doing that, Roger. You're still doing that. People often that re- we revisit things are surprised, um, no question. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they're almost like psyched and happy. Yeah, yeah. Because they know that, you know, you're a B-boy for life. Let's be real, you know. <laughs> that's what you do. I- yeah, we do so, you know, it's I I feel like I've been so embedded in, you know, a hip hop community, but uh, you know, coming out of graffiti yeah. and punk rock. And, you know, there we go. But it's in the sense it's all the fucking same thing. It is it's energy. It's just all energy. Exactly. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on, Roger. Long time coming, yeah. and I'm really pleased that uh, we caught you so early on in the day before things really started kicking off for you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Freight Train Graffiti book is out now. Get it on our site. It's beyondthestreets.com. It's pretty much the only place to get it. And we're we're continuing to make shit. So uh, keep it going. And I hope all of you listening go make your own shit too. They'll make your own shit. That's, see, there's the Jerry Springer sign off right there. You heard it from Roger, man. Thanks so much for joining us, my brother. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Killer Keller podcast, I like you, it's our fashion. You stay lucky, people. Don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't remember. Crime don't pay, but neither did I. Easy. Easy.